this is the presentation on topics 3.4 and 3.5, carrying capacity and population growth and resource availability. The central biological purpose of life is to reproduce. For individual organisms to accomplish that goal, they first need to survive, and an individual's survival is dependent upon its success in obtaining the resources that it requires. If successful in obtaining those needed resources, they can potentially reproduce and contribute to the growth of their population. Therefore, it is the availability of resources that directly influences how quickly or even if a population can grow. And ultimately, it is those resources, or lack thereof, that will eventually prevent population growth as resources become more scarce. The resources that an individual needs for its survival and potential reproduction can be simplified into one of three categories, food, water, and space. I'm using the term food generically to represent the matter and energy an organism requires. Producers are exceptional in that the matter they obtain is in the form of inorganic substances present in the environment, like minerals and ions in the soil, and carbon dioxide in the air, which they then use to build biological molecules with energy from the sun. For consumers, food represents any of a number of organic molecules they acquire by eating plants or other animals. Each species, from the smallest bacterium to the largest multicellular eukaryote, from plants to animals and protists to fungi, all have different quantity or concentration requirements of those resources. The degree to which those resources are available to a species in their required con concentrations or quantities determines both the individual's chance at survival as well as the population's potential for growth. If resources are insufficient, survival for the individual would be difficult or probably even unlikely. Individuals may even suffer from health consequences, making them sickly, less energetic, and perhaps even more susceptible to infection. Reproduction in a scenario like this is not possible. Therefore, a population experiencing a situation like this will decrease as the currently existing individuals are not only unable to reproduce, but they themselves are dying off as well. In a population that has a subsistence level of resources available, individuals are having their individual needs met but because there aren't enough resources for those individuals to reproduce and care for offspring, a population like this would experience a slow decline in size as individuals reach the end of their lifespan. Where an excess of resources is present, individuals not only receive what they need, but also have the resources necessary to provide for potential offspring this kind of population would experience moderate population growth. And for a population that has an extreme abundance of resources, not only do the individuals have what they need to survive, but there is also the potential to create and care for offspring at the maximum quantity for the species. A population under conditions like these will grow at its maximum potential rate. Something important to keep in mind is that a population's growth rate, either positive or negative, is very unlikely to remain the same. For example, a population with insufficient resources that's experiencing dramatic negative population growth may reach a size small enough that the resources available can accommodate. Population decline may slow or level off. On the other hand, that population with abundant resources, the one that's growing very quickly, won't be able to sustain that consistent growth indefinitely. With ideal environmental conditions, just like the right temperature, pH, availability of light, and with abundant resources, a population will experience exponential growth. In the short term, exponential growth is exhibited by a population that is still small enough that plenty of resources are going unused. But in the long term, exponential growth is unsustainable because all resources are finite. So instead, as populations begin to feel the stress placed on them 
as resource consumption is greater than resource availability, their growth rate slows and levels off. This is represented by the logistic growth model and incorporates the concept of carrying capacity. Every habitat, regardless of location or size, has limitations on how many individuals can be supported by it. Carrying capacity is determined by resource availability as well as things like weather events and seasonal changes. This means that carrying capacity is not some fixed value, but rather changes as environmental conditions change. For example, a drought can severely and indefinitely limit carrying capacity until such time as normal precipitation patterns return. Also, the same habitat during cold winter months is not likely to provide for the same relatively larger populations that might have been seen in spring and summer. The symbol used to represent carrying capacity, italicized capital K, is by definition the maximum number of individuals of a species that a habitat can support. In addition to carrying capacity not being a permanent fixed value, it is also not an impenetrable barrier that populations cannot exceed. When a population does exceed carrying capacity, that is accompanied by a situation in which individuals in that population, on average, are no longer able to acquire the resources they need. Therefore, overshoots are unsustainable, and a population that has exceeded its carrying capacity will eventually experience a decrease in size. Conversely, when a population is below its carrying capacity, that means that there are resources in the habitat going unused. Unused resources in habitats don't stay unused for long. So when they do get consumed, that fuels new population growth. As a population grows, the area or physical space that any given individual has available to it also decreases. This inverse relationship also applies to the food and water resources available to an individual. In this one hectare plot of land, where five individuals reside, each individual has one fifth of whatever resources are present available to them. But if the population was to increase in size, as does population density, because resource availability does not increase along with population growth, each individual in this larger population now only has one-tenth of whatever resources are present. What this essentially means is each individual now has less of what it needs in order to survive and potentially reproduce. Were this a population well below its carrying capacity, population growth and density increase could continue. But if this population was approaching or at its carrying capacity, the stressors presented by a lack of resources would prevent future sustained growth. Researchers are interested in studying population density and how it changes because those data are useful in determining how a population may or may not continue to grow in the future, as well as how the resources that are present in that ecosystem are going to be utilized. Through ingenuity, invention, and technology, humans have been quite successful in expanding Earth's carrying capacity for our population. Determining the carrying capacity of Earth for humans and concerns around overpopulation has been an area of interest for centuries. Because of the difficulty in studying and modeling the dynamic interactions between humans and our environment, estimates for our carrying capacity range from 4 to 16 billion with the median being somewhere around 9 to 10 billion. Historically, people have settled in places where resources, especially fresh water, were abundant and consistently available. Technological advancements have made it possible for people to live farther and farther away from those resource locations. Globally, the greatest population densities are found across much of Southeast Asia and in a few locations in Europe. Within the United States, the Northeast Coast and the regions around the Great Lakes possess the highest population density. There are all also higher densities in cities scattered across the eastern half of the country and west coast, but much of the central portion of the U.S. is sparsely populated. 
Limiting factors are those variables that do exactly what their name implies, limit the growth of populations. It is not only these limiting factors that are responsible for establishing carrying capacity, but they also apply pressure on populations to slow their growth as well. Limiting factors are categorized into one of two groups. The first is density-independent limiting factors, and these are ones that apply consistent pressure on a population to slow its growth. A population size, or how dense it is, does not influence the ability of a density-independent factor to stop or slow growth. Some examples of density-independent limiting factors include weather patterns, as well as climate, and seasonal changes. For example, the density of a white-tailed deer population does not influence whether or not a drought occurs, or how severe it is. Nor does it play a part in the changes in carrying capacity brought about by the cyclical seasonal changes from spring to summer to fall to winter, and back to spring again. Natural disasters, such as earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, are the result of plate tectonics and geologic processes, having nothing to do with how many orca or Douglas fir trees or ladybugs there are. The second category of limiting factors, density dependent, apply pressure to slow population growth with increasing strength as the population density increases. Competition for scarce resources becomes more fierce when more individuals are competing for them. Diseases spread more easily in a dense population than in a sparse one. An increasing prey population allows for an increasing predator population, which results in stronger regulation of the prey's population size. Of course, a decreasing prey population results in more competition among the predators, and eventually their population falls as well. The production and accumulation of waste, some of which may be toxic, becomes more extensive and hazardous to health as the population producing it grows in size and density. And that brings our exploration of these two topics to a close. Until next time, take care.